truth is there are many, many, much scriptural proof that God's will is clear for the earth. It's unchanged and unchangeable from Eden's garden. He created this earth for humans, and he created humans for this earth with a design for them to live happily, purposefully, and lovingly. We know he promises the meek will inherit the earth. And he says about Christ, with your blood you purchase men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and they will reign on the earth. That is why there is a kingdom of God. To bring his will, his purpose, his beautiful purpose, his will for this planet. It's probably a good time to stop and ask ourselves, well, then how is it, Peter, that Christians so oftentimes talk about heaven as the destiny? I think a good bit of it is in the words, just as I've been mentioned, inheriting the kingdom, inheriting eternal life, different words, different expressions, but they mean the same thing, the same destiny. And I think it might be worthwhile to keep in mind the definition of heaven, that everybody in this room and everybody everywhere would, would agree with the dictionary definition of heaven. The dwelling of the deity, the dwelling place of the deity, that's heaven. The dwelling place of the deity, and the dictionary says the place of utmost happiness. I think everybody will agree that that is heaven. And I think it's worthwhile to just keep that in mind as we consider some of the evidence now. So what I'd like to do is turn our attention to the, we know what Christ said about the kingdom and where. Now, what about the people that were taught by Jesus and the apostles? What did they believe? Did they believe that the kingdom of God would be on earth or did they think it was in heaven? Before we go into some of their writings and the historians that have analyzed their writings, and we need to clear up a couple of terms that they use. Kiliism or premillennialism or historical or classical millennialism all refer to the same thing of Christ returning and ruling in judgment for a thousand years before the, the final judgment. And, and this is in contradistinction to what's called amillennialism or postmillennialism, which are different theories that with somewhat different sequence of events. Now I'm going to quote to you from a book, The Case for Historic Premillennialism, edited by Craig Bromberg and Sung Wook Chung, which includes eight writings by eight different historians. I quote directly from research by Donald Fairburn titled, Millennial Tribulation Debates, Whose Side Was the Early Church On? My excerpts are specifically from section entitled, The View That Premillennialism Was the Consensus. Quote, Philip Schaff commented, the most striking point in the eschatology of the Antinocene age, that's the first 300 years after Christ, is the prominent Killianism or Millennialism. That is the belief of a visible reign of Christ in glory on earth with the risen saints for a thousand years before the general resurrection and judgment. More recently, A. Skevington Wood has argued that Irenaeus, Irenaeus is one of the, the early great Christian writers and scholars, Irenaeus' premillennialism is hardly original and simply develops the teachings found in the Didache, uh, which is a, a, a writing that lists the beliefs of the early Christians and the organization of the, uh, the congregations. And then he lists the great writers of that time period, Ignatius, Polycarp, Barnabas, Hermas, Justin. He concludes, the very fact that so much of what Irenaeus propounded covers ground which is now familiar to us bears witness to the antiquity of what is accurately labeled historic premillennialism. Whatever conclusion may be drawn from the testimony of Scripture on this issue, it must be conceded that in the first three centuries, the premillennial interpretation predominated. He goes on, Irenaeus regards premillennialism as the traditional and dominant view of the church. 
Irenaeus goes on to make three major arguments in support of his contention that there will be an earthly kingdom after the return of Christ. And then he goes on and describes those uh, three arguments and he concludes, this discussion shows that in Irenaeus' eyes, Killianism is the teaching of both the Lord and his church and non kiliastic eschatologies are the product of Gnostic influence, even though they are held by genuinely Orthodox Christians. He goes on to say, I will return to the relation between Gnosticism and Christian eschatology, but for now the point is that Justin, the greatest of the second century apologists, and Irenaeus, the first great theologian of the church, both believed that a physical, earthly kingdom of Christ after his return was the teaching of the Lord, the scriptures, and the majority of the church. So I can only ask you now, how did there ever come to be the alternative idea of calling it heaven? He goes on, and says, explains. He says, the task of providing the alternative that would come to dominate Christian eschatology during the Middle Ages fell to Augustine in his magnum opus, The City of God. Augustine argues that many Christians misunderstand Revelation 20. In Reve he, he believes that the, the thousand years that Revelation 20 describes is current history, and that, for instance, the first resurrection uh, described in it is actually the conversion of, of Christ uh, people to Christianity during that history period. He concludes that, and he says, It's fair to say that not only such a view such as Augustine's was not common, before the conversion of the Roman Empire, as far as we can tell from all the available evidence, but also that it could scarcely have arisen at all without a dramatic change in the church's social and political condition. So now we're on to it. What were the political and social factors that produced this change in the destiny of Christians? He explains. He said, Vicer another author, argues correctly that the fathers had to exercise much caution when writing documents intended for the Roman public. Although Rome would scarcely or hardly have looked twice at another religion offering the hope of eternal life in heaven, there were many of these in Roman times, a religion that held out to its followers the hope of an earthly kingdom following imminent cataclysmic events, including the fall of Rome, would surely have attracted unwanted attention from the empire. It should hardly be surprising then that Christians might firmly hold to the hope of an earthly millennium and yet mention this hope in public documents rarely or not at all. If word got out among the Roman elite that Christians specifically believe that Rome must fall before history's climactic events would be set in motion, this would surely have created trouble for the church. So they mentioned this aspect of their belief rarely. Nevertheless, this was what they thought. So the historical record is very clear of what Jesus Christ taught, what the early church taught, and what was taught for 300 years, and, and why it was expedient to use an ambiguous term of heaven rather than to describe what was necessarily happened with the fall of the Roman Empire. I don't really think this is a huge problem myself. I think if we keep in mind the definition of heaven, that it's the dwelling of the deity, dwelling of God, the dwelling place of God, and the scriptures are very plain. It says he came down and made his home with us, with, with humans. So I think it's, there's nothing wrong with calling it heaven, except that they need to understand that this, this heaven will then be on earth heaven on earth. Now what will it be like then? I don't know any more than anybody else does, but uh, another book came to my mind. It's from Brian D. McLaren. He's considered by Time magazine to be one of the 25 great evangelists. And he written a book called The Secret Message of Jesus. And basically the idea is that the secret message of Jesus is uncovering the truth that could change everything, and that is that the kingdom of God is on earth. And toward the end of the book, he comments on the scripture that means so much to all of us. It says, the kingdoms of the world to become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And he says, I'm not so 
completely sure why this line grabs my heart so much. Perhaps it's the idea that nothing will be wasted and this universe so precious, so wonderful, so amazing won't be discarded. What he's saying is that the earth isn't going to be left littered with dead bodies of evil people and the good gone somewhere else. The earth isn't going to be left discarded. And he says, I take great consolation and comfort in that. He, anyhow, he ends up, he says, perhaps all along, though, my deepest joy has never been to have my dreams come true, but rather to have God's one dream come true, that this world will become a place where God is at home, a place God takes pride and pleasure in, a place where God's dream comes true. So those are some some words from others that have described this and come to find out he he goes on in some detail and lists many many he said there are too many he said in just in the last few years bible scholars of every description have come to the same conclusion he describes why and how that could be and anyhow i'd like to read you just a few things from the ancient prophets to, as he described these things, keeping in mind that they not only give some hope to humans about what will happen someday when God's will is done, but they reflect the will, the desire, the wish, the dream of God for the, his planet, for his creation. And uh, I'm just what I'm going to do is just read you a few verses or a few snippets from the book of Isaiah. There are so many in the other prophets, but uh, these are very interesting to me, and I wanted to read them to you. This is what, in Isaiah 2, this is what Isaiah the son of Amos uh, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the na mountains. It shall be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, Come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations, and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they learn for war any more. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Isaiah 11. With righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, faithfulness the sash around his waist. They will neither harm nor destroy and all my holy mountain for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 25. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all people, a banquet of aged wine, the best meats, the finest wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him. He saved us. Isaiah 35 Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, the tongue of the dumb shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. A highway will be there, will be called the way of holiness. They will enter Zion with singing, everlasting joy will crown their heads. Finally, the last one I'll read you is from Isaiah 65. Behold, God says, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come into mind. But be glad, rejoice forever in what I create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. 
The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be an infant that lives but a few days or an old man that does not live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. He who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses, dwell in them. They'll plant vineyards, eat the fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree will be the days of my people, my chosen ones will long enjoy the works of their hands. They will not toil in vain or bring bear children doomed to misfortune, for they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I'll answer. While they're still speaking, I'll hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. Dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Now, when you read those things, I think the thing that maybe hits me the most is where he says, I will take the light. He wants it. God wants it. It's his desire. It's his will. It's his dream. I will take the light in what this happens. God is looking forward to this kind of a situation on his earth. 